As I was looking for job experience, um, looking to become a police officer, and the Air Force provided the opportunity to train in that field. Uh, it's called Security Forces, which is the Air Force equivalent of military police. So I was looking for that respect. Um, and also, it was just something I wanted to do. Uh, my grandfather had served um, back when he was much younger. He served in the Navy. Uh, which was right after World War II. And so I, I kind of see myself as following his footsteps in a lot of respects. So I think that's why I chose to do it. Where were you living when you enlisted? Uh, the same address I'm living at now in Glastonbury. Do you remember the date? I enlisted, uh, I believe it was the 7th of December, 2000. You're kidding. Yeah. Exactly? Exactly. Oh, well, Five happy years. anniversary. <laughs> Thank you. One more year. Why did you pick the Air Force? Um, I have a cousin in the Air Force, and I've heard a lot about it from her. Um, so I was immediately able to see the difference between the Air Force and the other branches of service. Uh, I think the Air Force, um, not to put the other services down, but. That's all right. You should hear what the Marines <laughs> say. <laughs> I, I can only imagine what they say about us. but. Um, I think the Air Force has the connotation of being um, a little bit more advanced as far as education, technology, uh, intelligence, all that stuff. Um, the quality of living is also much better uh, as far as what they have to offer, I think, from the Army and other branches of service. Um, and I think it shows the Air National Guard in particular because it affords you the opportunity to uh, serve from home. You don't have to really go anywhere unless you get activated and deployed. You're not going to get assigned to some other base in the country. You live at home. Um, you go to school. When you signed up um, with the Air National Guard, how long is the commitment? Uh, you can either do four or six years. I chose the six years. Uh, you have to do the six years in order to get the education benefits. So. Do you recall your first days in the service? Um, as far as, well, I enlisted. Like, do, you, do you go to boot camp or basic training? Yes. So I enlisted in December. Uh, I didn't go to basic training until the following August. I think it was August 1st or 2nd is when I actually left. What happened in between December and August? Um, there's either two opportunities as far as what you can do. Uh, you can either join the student flight, as it's called, in which case, um, you attend the drill weekends at uh, the Air National Guard base, and you basically learn stuff that you're going to do in basic training. So you already kind of have a heads up as far as what it's going to be like, and you're kind of preparing for it. Um, so you can either do that, you get paid for it, um, or you can just pretty much do nothing. And that's what I chose to do. So it, I was still in high school at the time, which is why I chose not to participate in the student flight. And I waited until August to go to basic training. And where did you go for basic training? It's Lackland Air Force Base in San Antonio, Texas. And what was boot camp like for basic training? Um, for me, it was actually pretty interesting. Um, our boot camp is six and a half weeks long. Um, and looking back, I really see it as almost like a joke. I'd almost like to go back and see what it is I went through because some of the stuff that you do is, I think it's just really silly. Um, what were some of the things you did? I think the Air Force has a slightly different version of basic training. Um, the Air Force is all about attention to detail, getting things exactly right. Um, and you have to do that in the Air Force, otherwise bad things will happen. Um, so there's a heavy emphasis placed on that. So you're not really doing a job, but to teach you that attention to detail, you have to have um, your barracks squared away, your bed has to be perfect, your uniforms have to be perfect, you have to do everything exactly as they tell you. Otherwise, so it's just very, it's very tedious in that respect. Um, but looking back, uh, you have to have your t-shirts folded in a perfectly six inch square and um, it's just silly stuff like that I think. But um, it was really interesting for me because September 11th happened uh, my last week of basic training 
which um, it was it was just crazy, I'd say. Um, it was either a Monday or Tuesday morning, I forget, um, but it was our last week there. We were about to graduate, um, I think, on a Sunday, a Saturday or a Sunday. Um, so your last week of basic training, you're pretty much preparing for the graduation. You wear your dress uniform the whole week to get used to wearing that instead of uh, your BDUs, uh, which is a camouflage uniform. And so we had just put those on for the first day uh, and our whole uh, six weeks we'd been there so far. Uh, and we had to go to a class uh, about halfway across the base. And so we got to this building where we have in the class is just about 8.30 in the morning. Uh, and we get in there, um, we were seated in the classroom and this guy comes running in. He's like, the Twin Tower was just hit by an airplane. And we're like, goodness, like, how could that happen? Um, a few minutes later, he comes back and in the second tower's been hit. And I mean, we had no TV in any of this room, so we're just sitting there listening to this guy popping his head in the room every couple minutes, updating us. And then um, about an hour later, he comes in, the towers are gone. They're just gone, and they were missing. And you, sitting in that classroom, not being able to see it, you could not comprehend it. I don't know if that was better or worse, because I know the rest of the country was sitting at home watching it on TV. And, um, but we were just sitting there clueless as to what was happening, just getting these updates every once in a while. Um, and at that point, the whole base went into a uh, force protection condition. Every few minutes, we'd be going into a higher one. Uh, they have Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, and Delta. Uh, Delta being the highest level of security. So within about an hour, we were already in Delta, and this was something I think not only us, but very few people on the base had ever experienced. Um, and people were just running around crazy. And so we're just sitting in this classroom not knowing what's going to happen to us. Like, because, I mean, when you think about it, any place is a target in the country. So here we are, we're a bunch of recruits thinking, what if, like, our base is going to get targeted? So at that point, uh, later in the afternoon, they finally made the decision we had to get back to our barracks. And so we just ran halfway across the base just to get there. Because in Delta, it's only mission essential people that are supposed to be outside. But they had to get us back to our dorm somehow. So we just, I don't know, it was crazy. And then for the rest of the week, we just stayed inside. We didn't go anywhere. So it was interesting. Um, and then we had our graduation that weekend, only all the airlines were shut down. So nobody's parents were able to come. It was just us. Um, they said we were the first, normally you, you graduate in your dress uniform. Uh, they said we were the first class since like Vietnam or uh, some war way back when to actually graduate in BDUs, which was kind of memorable, I guess, in that respect. So. Members that Nothing. No, it's just us. Do you remember any of your instructors from basic? I do. I think that's one of the, um, uh, they're called training instructors, TIs, instead of drill instructors like the other branches have. But um, I remember him saying, uh, you, you never forget who was your training instructor. And who I still remember Staff Sergeant Bills. Um, it was, he had been a, a firefighter in the Air Force becoming, he, before he became a drill instructor, um, his whole reason for doing so is because he saw a lot of problems with the new recruits coming into his unit and he wanted to do something about it. So he became a training instructor, um, which I think is good because he was a firefighter. Um, I know I'm a volunteer firefighter in my hometown. Uh, we like to joke around a lot. We have good times, and I think he did too. I think he was definitely one of the better training instructors there. Um, if we were out on the base in front of other people, I mean, he'd be on us about anything. But if we were back in the barracks, he could be cool with us. and He'd always put us in a place if we were wrong, but at the same time, uh, he was definitely respectable, I think. So. Did you receive good training? Uh, I would say so. I don't remember a lot of it. Um, um, 
the Air Force places more of an emphasis on uh, education, so we do a lot more classroom stuff instead of field work. Um, our second to last week there is actually in the field. It's actually on the same base, just in this quiet wooded corner. You go out and do field stuff. But the rest of the time you're in classroom or you're doing drill, marching, stuff like that. So um, it really isn't hard, but I would say it was, it was good training. It was just more educational based. Where did you go after your basic training? Uh, after the basic training, I went to the Security Forces Academy, which was actually on the same base on the other side of it. Um, that lasted ten and a half weeks, uh, in which time we learned everything. Um, security Forces in the Air Force is the equivalent of military police, but we actually have two functions. Uh, one is law enforcement, the other is security. Um, law enforcement being more police oriented. Um, whereas security is more field oriented, like securing areas, um, flight lines, uh, weapons storage areas, uh, doing work overseas, that's more of the security oriented. But we learn both of those while we're there. What's your preference? I actually prefer the law enforcement, I think, because um, like I said earlier, uh, when I came in, I wanted the experience of becoming a police officer. I wanted that training, so that's what I was looking for. As far as assignments or what you want to train on, or um, you get the same. Everybody gets the same training up until the late '90s. It used to be uh, specialized, where they had one school for uh, security, another school for law enforcement, and you could pick. Um, however, uh, they changed that. They consolidated it um, because they saw a need for people to be trained in both. Um, but you you can't pick what you want to do. You get both training or both sets of training, I should say. After your 10 and a half weeks for that training, where did you go? Uh, at that point, I returned home uh, to Connecticut. Uh, my base is Bradley Air National Guard Base. It's in East Granby, Connecticut. It's on the Bradley International Airport property. Um, and September 11th had happened, so they activated all National Guard units. Um, and so I came back and I was basically put on active duty, only I was at my home station, so I lived at home and worked full time at Bradley. And how long did you do that? Uh, we were activated, um, some people upwards of two years. I was activated myself for a year and a half. Um, I'd been back two months when they sent me on my first deployment, actually. So. The first one was to United Arab Emirates, and I remember the day I was told it. Um, they're like, "Hey, you're going to United Arab Emirates." I'm like, "Huh?" United Arab, what? United Arab Emirates. It's a small country next to Saudi Arabia. Uh, it's on the um, Persian Gulf coast, actually. It's a beautiful kind of well. Parts of it are beautiful. The one because it's right on the coast, so anything along there is beautiful. The rest of the country is just desert. But it used to be the richest country in the world, I believe, because uh, they're being on oil. Uh, it's now fallen back several spots, I think. But. So did you know what your job was going to be when you got over there? We had a pretty much idea. Uh, they tell you what to expect, what you're going to be doing. Um, before you go, you always try and call somebody that's there right now to get the scoop on what's going on, what you're doing. Um, so we had a pretty good heads up as far as when we got there. I mean, for me, this is my first deployment, um, especially being overseas. Uh, I really didn't know what to expect despite being like told everything about it. You just you have no idea until you get there. Um, I was pretty surprised when I got there, actually, though. Um, the base itself uh, was pretty nice, actually. Um, it was on an Emirati Air Force Base. We had our own. United States section of it. Uh, we had a tent city and then a part on the flight line, which is where all the planes park. Um, but I'd almost say that whole deployment was, it was like a resort. Uh, we had pools, we had gyms you could work out on. Uh, you Did could you sleep in barracks or in the tents? We slept in tents. Uh, on cots? On cots. The tents were furnished very nicely, actually. Another benefit of the Air Force, I'd say. Um, 
the tents, uh, they were marked off, inside, they were marked off into eight sections. Uh, seven of the sections had beds. Um, so you basically, it, it was divided off in curtains, but you'd get your own room basically divided off. Uh, you had a bed, um, a big wall cabinet, uh, a dresser, a nightstand, uh, a little light, and then the eighth section in every tent had a couch, uh, a TV with several cable channels and stuff, um, had a DVD player, a refrigerator, and all the tents were air conditioned too. So uh, we lived pretty well there. Um, you worked three days on, one day off. On your day off, you could take trips downtown, which was to the city of Abu Dhabi. So I did that a few times, but. The whole place was, I'd say, a resort almost while you were working, of course. And you were stationed there for how long? Stationed there for pretty much three months, exactly. It's about 90 days. Now, what did you do during the day when you were on duty? Um, I actually worked at night. We worked, um, I think it was 12 midnight to 12 in the afternoon was our shift. So. Um, I actually love working nights, but you'd go in, you'd have roll call around 11, uh, you'd get your assignment where you would be working, um, and there were several different areas you could work. Um, in the tent city area, we had towers all around the perimeter, um, so you could go up in those, uh, and you just sit and look out for anything that's not supposed to be coming towards you for your 12 hours, but I mean, we were in the center of the base anyways, so they had the whole perimeter of the base secured too, so we really never saw anything. Um, you had internal patrols, uh, which were two or four man teams, which you ride around and just make sure everything was well. Um, you had the gates to the tent city and the flight line. They had those. Uh, they had the flight line patrols, which again are the two or four man. Uh, they just ride around, um, and it's, it's either static patrol or I'm sorry, static posts or patrols were really the two main types of things you did. So either you're riding around in a Humvee or you're sitting in a tower for your 12 hours. Where did you go after the three months there? Uh, after our three months, we came back home. Um, we were just working. Uh, full-time active duty at Bradley until uh, the Iraqi war came up, in which case we got deployed again in January of 2003. So this was your second deployment. Were you joined yes. at a historic time? Really? Uh, definitely, you were yeah. <laughs> no. Uh, where were you deployed your second time? Uh, the second location is still classified. It's in southwest. Asia. Do you remember the date that you left for that? Um, I remember the date was very unclear. Um, it was like an on again, off again thing. Uh, we found out about it probably early December. Um, we were supposed to go right before Christmas. They put it on hold till after the holiday. Then we were just waiting around for two weeks. Um, they said pretty much you're going to get like two, three days notice. So I think we finally left uh, the 17th, January. or 16th or 17th of January, and we were there until uh, pretty much the very end of April. Uh, I remember I actually came home on my birthday, which probably was the best birthday present I've ever had. So. Did you know where you were going and what your duties were going to be before you left the United States? We pretty much had a good idea. Um, we knew where we were going, only the location was classified, so we couldn't really talk about it. Uh, we, we couldn't tell our families, really. Um, the thing with us is we were told where we were going, um, so a few of us told our families, and then a few days later, like, oh, by the way, it's uh, classified, so you're really not supposed to tell anybody. So by that point, I'd already told my mother where we were going, so at least she knew, but um, nobody else was found out. Um, tell me as much as you can tell me. It's, it's interesting because this place was the complete opposite of my first deployment. So, no luxury. Uh, absolutely no luxury. Um, 
so I went, I went on my first deployment and seeing like, oh, this is what deployments are like. Cool, I'll volunteer for them all the time. So we got on this one expecting maybe something similar. Not at all. Um, the first deployment, we took a chartered uh, civilian airplane over to the base. So I mean, we had regular seats, food, everything, pillows. Uh, the second trip, we took military airplane. It was a C-17 cargo plane. Um, and I remember the worst thing about it was just how cold it was. I mean, it's it's only slightly here. You're riding in the cargo bay along the wall in these jump seats, basically, for you know, the flight probably lasted 15, 16 hours. You have one stop along the way. Um, but it was just cold. And you only had what you brought with you. The other stuff was packed up on the pallets. Um, so you were fortunate enough if you had a pair of gloves or something. So we were on the way home, we were smart enough to dig out blankets and stuff and reserve them. But um, so it just started off bad in that way. Uh, we got there, um, and this was a bare base. Um, it was the country we were in. Uh, we basically um, landed on our base. We had agreements to have our own section of it. Uh, so we landed. Uh, it was the middle of the night, and I remember. It was, everything around it was just dark. The only light in this place was from the airplane itself. Um, but we were sitting on the plane. The first thing they told us, we all had our weapons out ready to go. Um, and everything was very secret. So this guy who had already been there gets on the plane. He's like, you guys have weapons. Uh, you're going to need to hide those. We're like, what? Um, we had to keep everything secret. Like nobody on this base was supposed to know what we were really there for. Um, so we had to hide our weapons, first of all. How do you hide a weapon? Uh, it turned out, like, you, you really can't, but we were fortunate enough to have a little um, John Deere Gator tractor uh, with a back to it. So we, we were able to put them all in there and just tie them temporarily. Um, so we got off the plane in the middle and everything around it was just dark. And I remember there was, like, there was one yellow light on the flight line that lit up everything. And all I could think of was just, like this dark street corner, like we're in the middle of nowhere, just this dark street corner with the one yellow light, which like makes everything kind of yellowish and dark. And it was just really weird, I'd say. Uh, but we got there, we checked in with the very few other people who had been there. Uh, we got stuck living in this uh, warehouse, basically, on this base, uh, which was, it's kind of like a half circle, a warehouse type thing. Um, and the place was huge, but we were the second team there, so we moved in right next to the first team, just huddled in this little corner of this warehouse. Uh, and for the next few weeks, more people would arrive, and more people and more people, until this entire warehouse was filled up with people. Um, they had We slept on cots. The whole place was filled up with cots. You could barely move. By this time, there was several hundred people living in there. Um, so as you can imagine, it, uh, it smelled a little bad. Um, and at that point, they decided, well, so we, they had to build a tent city for all these people because it was a bare base. And they hadn't really started that yet. And they needed places to put these people. So they came up with the idea, let's fill the place with bunk beds. So in, over the course of a week, the population doubled to about like 500 people in this warehouse, I'd say. It was absolutely crazy. Um, so after about four weeks of living there, they finally finished the tent city, and we were able to go move into our tents. Um, was that an improvement in living conditions? Only slightly. Uh, it was still much different from the, my first deployment. I mean, you had no, uh, you still slept on cots uh, instead of. about the width of the cot next to it, and that was it. Um, we were still able to like section it off with blankets and stuff, just so we kind of had some privacy. But uh, it was still, it was, it was tight. But you only had 13 people instead of 500 living with you, which was better. So. Now, can you tell me what your duties were while you were on that base? Duties were pretty much similar. I um, mean, we had the tent city, which we had the towers around. We secured those. Um, the towers, in this case, all we did was take uh, large metal boxes, pile them up with sand, and make these little wooden shelters on top. And that was your post, whereas on the first deployment, we had these 
uh, prefabricated, uh, bulletproof, air-conditioned towers, which were, had electricity and everything. So these were the complete opposite of those. Um, but she did that. You had your patrols in the tent city, you had patrols in the flight line, and all that stuff. It's similar work, just just not as well luxurious. It's not really luxurious, but not as nice, I guess. So. Did you see combat at all? Um, not not direct combat. The only thing we saw was, I mean, the planes are loaded up with bombs. They go off to war. They come back and the bombs are missing. So, I mean, I think one of the weird things about it, though, is uh, after a few weeks and before the war started, we were able to get television uh, in our dining hall, and they provided all the news channels. So when the war started, um, it was really awkward because you're watching your own war on TV. You're over there, but you're a little bit of a distance away from it. So you'd be working, you'd see the planes leave with the bombs, and you'd be, you'd just get off, you'd go eat your meal and watch it on TV, and you'd see like everything blowing up in Baghdad and Iraq and stuff, because you had all the reporters embedded on the front lines and everything. So was, I think that was one of the weirdest things, is just watching your own war on TV while you're there. Oh, that must have been strange. So you did have news, constant news all along? We were able to get news, yeah. So. And these were your American channels? Yes, we had like CNN stuff like that, so. Were you awarded any medals or citations? Um, we had several. Uh, I don't know which came from which deployments, but. Um, which ones I can you remember? have a whole list. Um, well, one of the big ones which came out because of all the, the recent wars is Global War on Terrorism. Um, I got that one. There's two of them. There's an expeditionary and a uh, a homeland one, so I got both of those for working stateside and overseas. Um, we got an outstanding unit award uh, for my second deployment while we were over there for everything that we did. Um, I had like a meritorious service medal. Um, there's several different expeditionary medals, um, so I got a few of those. I, I don't know what their titles are. There's Air Force ones, Armed Forces ones. We got both of those. Um, ended up with two short tour ones, which is just if you go overseas, you get a, uh, it depends on the time and your branch of service as to how long you're over there, but we qualified for two of those for both deployments. So. And there will be a list with the biographical data in Sean's folder. Sean, I'm going to ask you a few questions about living conditions both of your deployments. How did you stay in touch with your family? Um, on the first deployment, we had uh, an MWR building, basically, which is, uh, I forget what it stands. It's basically like a recreation building. Uh, I think it's welfare and recreation, something like that. Um, but we had uh, computers, telephones, so you could go in on your time off. You could go in, email home, or you could uh, uh, they had like little phone booths uh, where you just go in and call. Uh, we were able to rig it up so uh, all the towers on the edge of the tent city had uh, phone lines in them. So we were able to uh, get some phones, plug them in, and uh, we rigged it up with the communications flight uh, where we could actually call home from those towers. So while you were working, if you wanted to take a couple minutes and call home, uh, you were actually able to. So how often would you be in touch with home? Um, you're only supposed to call, it's like two 15-minute phone calls per week. Uh, I pretty much stuck to that because I mean, with all the other stuff you're doing, you really don't have a lot of time. Um, but I stayed up on email. I'd, I'd usually save my phone calls for home, and I'd email all my friends during the week. You had a lot more time for that. Pretty much, yeah. I mean, there's restrictions as you can't send like attachments because uh, it takes up bandwidth, but as far as text, you can, I mean, as much time as you have, you can, I mean, you had to be careful because there's, there's always lines, so you, you do what you have to, you get off, you come back later when there's no lines. So everybody had the opportunity. Uh, the second deployment was a little bit different uh, because it was bare base when we got there, we had nothing. So uh, it took about, 
know, two weeks before they were, uh, uh, well, actually, when we got there, they were able to call back because they had like one phone line for the whole base. Um, so they were able to call our unit at home, and then our unit at home called their families just to let them know we had gotten there. Um, but it was about two weeks before they actually uh, set up computers before we could email. And they only set up two at first for this whole base of about a few hundred people that were there. So the first night it opened, the line was incredible. Um, I don't know how many people were there, but it, it was tight. Um, after a little while, they got some more computers and some phones. So, and then a couple months into it, they finally got uh, a little building where they put a bunch of phone lines in and some computers. Uh, and the lines, they, they still didn't have as many, so the lines could be long at times, but you, you still had to email and phone. What was your unit number? Uh, at home, it's the 103rd Security Forces Squadron, which is part of the 103rd Fighter Wing. The food on our yeah, on our first deployment again it was like a resort. The food had been uh, catered by uh, a hotel off base, so we ate pretty well. They had a variety of stuff they served, uh, but the food was really good. They had like every kind of breakfast food every morning, cereal, anything you wanted, um, lunch did and you dinner. Go off base to eat, or did they bring an on base? Um, actually, there was several opportunities when you went off base on your uh, on your day off. Um, uh, the United Arab Emirates is a, it used to be a British colony, so there's, it's very, there's a lot of British people still there. Uh, there's also a lot of American restaurants because it is British. Um, so they had things like Chili's, uh, McDonald's, uh, uh, what else did they have? They had uh, Pizza Hut. Uh, they had all kinds of different American restaurants, so when you went downtown, you could actually eat at those. Uh, and the food was pretty much the same. Uh, I didn't bring it, but I actually brought home a takeout menu from Chili's, uh, which is written in Arabic, so it's pretty cool. Uh, the food is pretty similar. Um, but yeah, when you went downtown, you could eat at those restaurants. Uh, they had a, the base teamed up with Pizza Hut, too, uh, a certain night every week. Uh, the first, like, 50 people to place their orders on base, they could get Pizza Hut takeout. Uh, you had to pay for it. Um, but And then the food and the dining hall, um, they had a similar menu, it revolved like every two weeks or so. It was the same food, but you had different choices every day, and it was good food. Every Friday night, they'd have a uh, cookout, too. I remember one of the best things is that they're called shawarmas. Uh, they're basically like a fajita, almost, um, but they're wrapped up. they got chicken or beef and stuff inside, and they're really good. And they cook those every Friday night, and steaks and stuff. So. Food was excellent there. Uh, the second place, uh, obviously, much different. Uh, so we got there. Obviously, no dining hall. So we ate MREs as soon as we got there. Uh, they had a whole stock of MREs. Um, so we ate those for about the first two weeks until they finally got a field kitchen up and running. We went to that first day, the first day it opened, and the food. Uh, I don't know how to describe it. There was some purple stuff and some white stuff and. You kind of picked, ate what you could, uh, and then we ran back and grabbed some more MREs. And for about a week or so, they gave you the opportunity of eating MREs or the hot mystery food. Uh, so we stuck to the MREs. After that, they started rationing the MREs uh, just to us, because um, whereas uh, all the other people on base have the opportunity to like leave their job station, go eat and come back. We're stuck on our post for our whole ship. So we kept getting our MREs and we'd save them um, and eat those so we could just avoid eating this, uh, the field kitchen food. Um, and then finally they just shut all the MREs off. They said they had to reserve them just in case like we really needed or something. Uh, we were still able to like sneak in and like steal them every once in a while. So we continued eating them like as long as we absolutely could. But after about a month and a half, they built like a real dining hall. Um, food still wasn't great. Got a little bit better. It was edible, um, but they had like different choices. They had like breakfast food and 
cereal, and lunch and dinner food. Um, everything was just chicken and rice though, lunch and dinner. It was always chicken and rice, but in different form. So, I mean, it wasn't great, but it was edible. Um, and that's yeah. the gift care packages from home? Yep. Um, the mails, the, it works weird. Sometimes you'll have a package sent from home. It'll get there in five days. Other times it takes like three weeks to get there. So there's no consistency at all. Um, but on both places, we were definitely able to get care packages. I had a few of those. Um, both places, well, the first deployment, uh, everywhere you go, you have a, it's called a BX, um, which is an exchange. It's AP's Air Force, or Army and Air Force Exchange Service. It's basically like a little convenience store. So we had that all set up on the first base, anything you needed, um, you could get there. The second base, uh, when we got there, it obviously didn't exist, so it took them about a month and a half to set up. And I remember the first day that opened up, the line was tremendous because everybody needed stuff. Um, but, I mean, once it calmed down a little bit, you were able to get the stuff you need, toiletry stuff. And they had a couple other things. They had magazines, and a couple different items and stuff, so it was good. Did you have sufficient uh, supplies that you needed to do your job? Oh, definitely. I mean, they had all kind of, we brought all the supplies we needed. Um, the supply section for the base had all the rest of the stuff you could possibly need, but. And they brought um, that all with them? Brought it all with us. Yeah, the second deployment. Um, yeah, it was just, so the we brought it all. The things you didn't have were mostly personal items. Until the BX opened. Um, well, was, they told you bring enough for uh, sixty or ninety days of stuff you so needed because you, you knew. Yeah, there was because bare base. There's nothing there, so you knew you had to bring what you needed. Uh, so soap you, and all that. Before you so. left the United States, did you know you were going to a bare base? Yes. Yeah. We were, so we were told. You were prepared so. now in I would say so. I mean, there's some stuff I would probably would have brought differently, but overall, I, we were well prepared. Did you feel pressure or stress in either of your deployments? Uh, the first deployment was, again, a resort. I mean, not much stress there. You just you you work your three days off, or your three days on, one day off, um, and it was great. The second deployment. Um, we pretty much had no days off. Uh, we worked every day. Uh, we do 12 hour shifts. Well, for security forces, uh, we do 12 hours on shift, but you show up an hour before your shift for roll call to get your assignment and all that. And you usually don't get relieved off your post and get back to your tent until an hour, hour and a half after your shift has actually ended. So in actuality, you're working 14, 15 hours every day and then you go back to your tent, you sleep, you get up and do it all over again. Well, that must have been stressful. And I mean, it was stressful, but I, I can imagine not nearly as stressful for people on the front line. So I mean, you feel for them too. So. Was there anything that you did special for good luck? Um, not that I recall. I know the chaplain would come around and they had this prayer that, um, I forget what it was called, but he gave everybody a copy and was like, keep it with you. So I kept that with me. But other than that, I, I can't really think of anything. What did you do for entertainment? It sounds like you had more entertainment on your first deployment. There was far more entertainment there. Um, I mean, they had the pool, the gym. Uh, every afternoon, they'd have water volleyball in the pool, which was a lot of fun. Uh, you could suntan. Uh, you go downtown on your days off. There's all kinds of activities. The second place, there was nothing. Well, first of all, you were working uh, all day. You get off work, you go to bed, you get up again, do it all over again. So you didn't really have time to do anything else extra. After a while, once things calmed down a little bit, they set up a volleyball court. Uh, they created a gym with donated stuff, basically. Um, I know. One of the things we brought is we did bring, you have all the stuff you're supposed to bring as far as a unit, and it gets put in these metal boxes called connexes. So we put all the stuff we were required to bring in there, and the thing was only half filled. So like anything else you want to bring, go ahead. So we threw like a table, lawn chairs, uh, we threw a TV, 
Uh, we brought Xbox, video games, stuff like that. So, you know, um, when we first got there and everything was kind of, we were still trying to figure out what was going on. We had a little bit of extra time. So I remember sitting around playing video games a lot and doing stuff like that. Um, but once things started picking up and the war was approaching and going on, we had no time for anything extra. Did you see any USO shows? No, we had nothing. Uh, my first deployment, Drew Carey had been there about like two weeks before we got there, so we just missed that. But other than that, we had nothing. Did you have any leave while you were on your deployment? No. I mean, we were only there for three and then three and a half months or so, so they don't give you leave or anything. And I know on your first deployment, you were able to travel off the base and see some of the sites. On um, your second deployment, did you move the base at all to see anything else? We did. There was actually two bases. Um, I don't know. I think they were like 60 miles apart or so, about an hour apart. Um, but they were just, they're in the middle of the desert. There's nothing there. So we did uh, convoys in between the two bases occasionally as far as equipment or munitions and stuff like that. Um, but you'd leave the base, you'd be on this highway through the desert, um, and there's just nothing out there. I mean, at all. It's just like hills and rocks. And the landscape there was really weird. Um, it was actually like this ancient volcanic lava rock that covered the whole surface of the landscape. So it was just, it was black. It was probably one of the weirdest things I've ever seen, but they just have like hills and valleys of this and just this highway right through the middle of it all until you get to the other base. And so, so, but there, there's, there's nothing. No, no. That must have been strange for you coming from Connecticut. Um, oh, it's, it's far different. I and mean, I mean, the United Arab Emirates, you're right on the Gulf Coast, so everything is irrigated well enough where they have trees, they have grass and spots. And so it's nice, I mean, especially if you go into the city, you're right on the water. It's beautiful. I know the rest of the country is just desert. Um, but the second place, we were in the middle of the desert, and there was nothing. And there's no plants, even. It's just this rock that's black. Do you recall any particularly humorous or unusual events? Um, there's definitely a few. Uh, we'd been there for a few weeks. Um, and they were still building the tent city. And while they were building it, we had one patrol that sat out there. So this is, I work nights there too. Uh, this is the middle of the night. And I was, uh, it's called a controller, which is basically like a dispatcher for security forces, um, like a police dispatcher almost. You answer the phones, you do the computer and all that stuff. But um, So I was working the desk there. And this patrol out in the middle, and they were like a couple miles off too. And this patrol calls in, and the radios weren't this great, so it was all kind of crackly. Um, we have flares going up. I'm like, what? Like, we see flares off in the distance. We're like, uh, OK, that's not good. So in order to figure out like where these flares are going off, you have uh, two different patrols uh, get a compass direction on uh, like which way it is from their location. And then you get a map, and you figure out where the patrols are, their compass directions. And then you can intersect it and see where these like flares kind of are. And it was really weird because uh, the whole base was like a circle almost. Um, and so your whole perspective, especially at night in the desert where there's nothing, is just off. So like we had a hard time figuring out where these flares are. But you could see them. And they'd go up and then come down. They'd burn for like 30 seconds. And they'd go out and you get a few of them. So the first night, couldn't figure out what this was. Um, two nights later, it happens again. Same kind of thing. Um, so we call the control tower for the air, air base there. I'm like, do you have any planes dropping flares in the area? They're like, nope, we don't have anything going on. Um, and it's the second time, I could not figure out where these flares were coming from. So um, after a while, like we still had no clue, but we had to put something on the report for this. So we started making things up. The first time, like we said, it was a wedding, and they were shooting fireworks. The second time, they were doing construction, and it was a, a crane. But this pretty much went on for the same time, the whole time we were there, I should say. Um, and we really never figured out what it was, only um, 
we came up with an acronym for it, which was uh, Elusive Long Range Visual Investigative Search, which uh, the acronym for it is ELVIS. So we came up with ELVIS sightings. And, and that's on the official report. We, we, we really never had a conclusive answer, no. Never figured it out, as far as I know. Is that a new airport term now? Uh, we're waiting to see it come up in the books. It's on the official report, so we wouldn't be surprised if it is. But. Can you recall any other humorous events? Um, not off the top of my head, no. You can no. think of it during your Okay. Yeah. You guys play pranks on each other? I mean, I'm sure all military people do. There's always pranks. I can't think of any off the top of my head, but there's there's always stuff you do. Um, was your unit all male? Were there any women in your unit? Uh, and the team we brought, it was all male, but there was other females on the base from other units and stuff, so it was both. And what was that like? Because this is the first generation that's living with uh, women in their I'm I'm young. I'm used to it. I mean, the whole Air Force is like that. I mean, you go through basic training, and you're not living with them, uh, with females, but you have, like, sister flights almost. Like, the, the flights you go through basic training with, uh, there's, like, 40 people or so. But you live in the same... Um, they're set up in, like, pods almost. Uh, so you have a squadron, a pod. It's got... Uh, like 10 flights or so, so you, there's two floors, so you might have an all-male flight downstairs and all-female flight upstairs, so you definitely work with them, and again, and on base, once you get into regular work, you're always working with females, so for me, I'm just used to it, because, I mean, that's what I, I, I'm still young, that's what I know. No, we live in different tents, but for the most, we're all housed in the same area. So. And for the record, Sean does have some photographs that will accompany his file. What did you think of the officers and fellow soldiers? Oh, when did you go up the rank? Um, in the Air National Guard, as soon as you enlist, uh, you're basically in E3, which is an airman first class. You don't actually get that rank until you graduate basic training, which is a little different from active duty, in which case it could take like upwards of two years to get that rank. So one of the incentives for joining the Guard is as soon as you graduate basic training, you already get the your uh, two stripes, airman first class, um, which is nice because when you go through the Security Forces Academy, you're kind of up on everybody else going through the academy, so they put you in positions of leadership, which is nice. Um, another thing about the Guard is uh, once you come back from your technical school, which for me was the, uh, the Security Forces Academy, they pretty much just give you your next rank, which is Senior Airman. They've changed that since then, where you need to complete your upgrade training uh, to get your next skill level. Um, before you you get senior airmen. So I, I came back, and it was uh, about a month, and I had gotten E4, which is senior airmen. When you came which, back from your first deployment? When I came back from uh, my technical school, before I went on my first deployment. So I went on my first deployment as a senior airman, which actually was kind of strange, because there was uh, a person I went through the uh, Security Forces Academy with, there was a girl I went through, she was in uh, my flight, um, so we were in all the same classes, um, but we're on the same deployment just like a couple months out of like all our school and stuff, and I'm already an E4 senior airman, and she's still an airman, which is like E1, so like already, like we've only been in the same time, but I'm three ranks up on her. Uh, actually, just this past May, I got E5. And that was after both the deployments and you were back home? Yes. May of 
it was, it was May or June of 2005. I think I was officially given it in, I, it was probably June 1st, and I got it in June, I believe. Back to officers and fellow uh, soldiers. As so far as the Air Force called soldiers. Uh, we're airmen, actually. We're a little different. Officers and fellow airmen. <laughs> um, I think something that differs uh, between the Air Force and other branches of service is you don't really work under the direct supervision of an officer. You really don't see them like they're in their offices doing planning and all that stuff. You don't work right under them. You work under um, enlisted managers and supervisors, and that's a big difference from other branches. Um, so you really just don't see the officers. Every once in a while, like the officers in charge of your group, like security forces, will come out and do post checks and see how you're doing. Um, so you'll see them every once in a while like that. I know our second deployment, uh, our officers were a little different than what normally happens. Uh, if, if something happens and you need someone to go check it out, you send a patrol. Um, but for some reason, like our officers for our unit, we had like three of them, they always wanted to go out and check it out themselves, which I don't know, they're the officers, they make the decision as far as doing that, but that's not what traditionally happens, I think, but that's what they did. They'd be their own patrol and go check it out. Um, but other officers you really don't see as, as much. Uh, the enlisted folks, we're all, we're like a big family. We, um, as far as your shift, like you know everybody on it. You work with somebody different every day if you're not working by yourself. Uh, there's different patrols, different areas. So you see everybody. Um, and the whole group is made up of people from different bases around the United States too. So you work with people from like Alabama or Texas stuff like that. So you meet people from other areas too in addition to your own people, which is good. But you you become really close with a lot of the people there. Do you stay with the same people in your one unit? Like when you, from the very beginning, did you go um, on deployment to both places with the same mm, people? No, what it is is like we have our squadron at Bradley, which is all the security forces. Um, and each deployment that, that comes up, they pick uh, the, we work in 13 man teams, they pick the 13 people who are going to go. It's not the third, same 13 people every time, so it's different. Um, but you know you're at home with them, so you already know them, which is good. And then you get over there, and so you have your team from home, and then there's the team from another state and another state, and they all join together to form the security forces group over there, and you all work together. Did you make any close friendships? Not really close friendships. Um, I mean, you work with the same people every day. Some people like to keep in touch with other people, but I, I didn't really do that. Did you keep a personal diary? No. Uh, how long did you stay in uh, your second deployment? Second deployment was three and a half months. Uh, we went the middle of January, came home the very end of April. It was 2003. We were still on active duty. Um, I think I worked uh, still on active duty until June uh, of that summer, and then I was finally released. And I'd built up so much leave time that I had like I don't know, three or four weeks of leave time saved up. So my whole last month, I wasn't actually working, but I was still getting paid because you just you burn off your leave. Now you which did was your nice. active duty when you came back late right here in Connecticut at Bradley. Yes. Yep. So then you're still in the service, but you're not on active duty. Still in this traditional status where you do your one week in a month and two weeks a year, and whereas that's what you're supposed to do on paper. We always do more than that for various different things. What do you typically do now, now that you're on personal status? Um, basically, all we do is train in case we get activated again and go on active duty or deployments. Um, there's still always taskings for deployments that come up. Um, we have one up and coming for 
next summer that we're trying to get on to. Um, and we just do different various forms of training. Uh, there's ancillary training, which is basically requirements you're supposed to do every year. It's different kinds of classes. Um, so you show up for your one week in a month. Uh, we get there at 7.30, we'll do roll call. We'll do training for the morning, take an hour for lunch, come back, training in the afternoon, different stuff. There's training within your own unit. There's base training that you have to do, all these different requirements. Uh, occasionally, we'll go out in the field because that's kind of what our job requires. Um, we'll go out. Uh, there's a military reservation in Connecticut. We go there a couple times. Is uh, all this training that you do now in Connecticut? So you generally, live yeah. Yeah, we still live at home. Yes. Now, I know you're going to uh, Central Connecticut State University. Um, is that partially because of your involvement in the military? Do you it, get any benefits because you went? Yes. Uh, what is this? And one of the reasons I joined is because uh, every state is different as to how they work it with their National Guard troops. But in Connecticut, uh, you get what's called a tuition waiver, whereas as long as you're Going to any state school, which includes Central, Eastern, Western, uh, Yukon, or any of the community colleges, um, your tuition is paid for as long as you enlisted for six years and you're regularly attending your uh, one week in a month and two weeks a year and you're progressing satisfactorily. Um, the thing they don't tell you is uh, when you get your college bill, uh, only half of it is really tuition, the other half are these so-called fees. So the tuition half is covered. Um, you still have half of it, which is these fees, and they give you what's called the GI Bill, which is different from the active duty GI Bill. Uh, for the reserve one, it's called Chapter 1606 uh, for the VA, and you get uh, a certain amount every month that you're in school, and that goes directly to you for whatever expenses you need. Um, it's a base fee of about 200 and something dollars. And depending on what career field you're in, which for me is security forces, any, uh, there's certain designated career fields which are like critical. And so in order to entice people to get people into that unit, they give what's called the GI Bill Kicker, which is an extra $350 a month, at least for me. I don't know if it's the same for others. So uh, every month that I'm in school, I get a check for comes out to 600 and uh, 50 something dollars or so, uh, which goes right to me, and you use that to pay for the rest of your school and whatever else you need, books, uh, travel expenses, anything like that. Um, if you don't need it and you're just paying for school on your own, like for me, I got a scholarship which over the other half, that money just goes directly to me for other stuff, so it's like I'm getting paid to go to school. Um, there's a slight difference between the, uh, the uh, tuition waiver and your veteran's benefits. Once you become a veteran, uh, you get the veteran's exemption, which essentially does the same thing. It's just, it's good for the rest of your life, whereas the tuition waiver is only good for like 10 years or something, or as long as you're enlisted in the guard. Uh, the veteran's exemption is good for the rest of your life. As long as you're in a state school, uh, which I mentioned before, or, and you have to be progressing towards a degree program. When did you actually enroll at CCSU? Uh, I'd enrolled, or I'd applied while I was still in high school, uh, before I went to basic training, with the assumption that uh, I was going to go to basic training in August, I'd come back in December, so I'd miss a semester, but I was going to start in the spring. Uh, that didn't happen, because we came back, got activated, so I'd, I'd put the you fill out a, a form, basically they just hold your application until you're ready to, I'd already been accepted, so they just hold your position until uh, you start again. So I finally started uh, the fall semester of 2003. Um, so this was after both of your deployments? Yes, and after we were deactivated. One of the good things I'd say though is, uh, in the Air Force anyways, I don't know how other branches do it, um, any military training, any formal training that you do, whether it be basic training, the Security Forces Academy, you get college credits through all that, through the Community College of the Air Force. Um, I got like 27 credits out of there, which transferred over, 
and then I had another 11 credits from uh, AP, uh, which is the classes that I took in high school, which is advanced placement. If you pass the test, you get college credit for it. So without ever having gone here, I already had, well, without in, ever having attended a college before, I had 38 credits that I came out with. And so I've basically skipped out on a whole year of school. Like I'll be done uh, in the spring after only three years of going to school full time, which is nice. Doing any veterans organizations? Um, actually, the president of the Veterans Appreciation Organization here at CCSU. Um, I joined last year. I was just a regular member. This year, I took over as president. What kinds of things do you do? Uh, we actually do a lot of things. Um, most of our events revolve around Veterans Day. Uh, we have a Veterans Day ceremony. Um, we do. Veterans Day dinner at night. Uh, we pass out various awards. That's more. The ceremony is a school event, whereas uh, the dinner is a club event for us. Um, we also put on a concert this year. Uh, it was America Salutes. We had a group uh, band from Plainville come in. Uh, the admission was Toys for Tots, which goes to the Marines. So we uh, helped organize that. Um, Right now, we're in the works uh, to get a plan revised, or revived, I should say, to get a veterans memorial built on campus. Uh, the plan had come up uh, several years ago, but it was lost when uh, the previous president uh, resigned. And so the whole thing was just lost. Now we're in the works to get that revived and get a monument built. Um, I'd personally like to see it built before uh, next Veterans Day next year. Um, so we're going to be hard at work uh, on that for next semester. Um, the other thing we do is uh, an Armed Forces Recruiting Day, which is in the works for next semester, too. Um, we help out all the recruiters in the state. Uh, they come here and set up their booths, and we sponsor them all. Uh, that way they can get new recruits. Um, but it just helps them get onto campus because there's a lot of controversy these days as far as recruiters coming onto campuses and stuff like that. So we sponsor them and help them out. Um, and another thing which is going to be big next semester is a lot of the Army National Guard troops, uh, which are part of the club, they make up, we're a very small club to begin with. Um, so they, they almost make up half of our membership, which is only like 15 to begin with. Um, they're all. They're, they're all, uh, actually a lot of them, most of them are Army. Um, me and a couple others are Air National Guard. Um, but about half of them are deploying in January overseas. So our club's going to be very small. But one of the things we do for deployed CCSU students is called Operation Blue Devil. And what we do is uh, we order a whole bunch of t-shirts which say Operation Blue Devil. And they got all kinds of different stuff on the t-shirts. Um, we order two sets of them. Uh, one is like gray and blue, the other is brown, which is what like uh, the t-shirts army troops wear. Um, and what we do is every t-shirt, every uh, gray and blue one we sell on campus, we donate one to the troops overseas. And every one that we sell on campus, we take the money and that's used to uh, do two things. One is ship the brown t-shirts overseas, which costs a lot of money. The other is to make up care packages for the students who are deployed from CCSU. Um, and we've done that in the past. And with them leaving next semester, that's definitely going to be something we do again. So we actually do quite a lot with the very few members we have. Yes, so. Wow. All right, now you, you can't discuss your career after all because you haven't actually gone out on your career yet. What is your career path? Is it a career? Um, I, I finished my degree uh, in May. Um, What's your degree in? It'll be in criminology, a bachelor's, uh, minoring in communications. Uh, I've always wanted to be a police officer. Recently, I've been uh, enlightened as to many other career fields. Um, so I've been thinking about going to law school, maybe in the near future. And I think one of the things I'd really like to do is become a prosecutor and eventually someday become a judge, if that's doable. Uh, we'll have to see. but. I mean, there, there's so many different career fields out there, and each has their benefits. And so just 
in the last year being a senior um, and being in, in upper level classes, they kind of experience, they give you experience as to what else is out there. And so this year I've been getting that and it's kind of opened the door for, I've been looking at a whole bunch of other stuff. So. Before, and uh, as I was listening, enlisting, I should say, um, I remember thinking, like, this is going to be a great thing to do. I'll get the money for school. Um, you know, I'll take a couple trips. Every, cause you do your two weeks a year. Uh, some places, sometimes you go on mini deployments to do training. Uh, it's usually stateside, or you just work at Bradley. Uh, the money would be good, stuff like that. I'm thinking, there's not going to be any wars in the near future. Well. Shortly thereafter, I was uh, told otherwise, or saw otherwise, um, then we went to war. But I don't know if it's changed my thinking at all. Um, I think one of the best things is I've been able to see what it is. It's given me, I basically grew up really fast, I'd say. Um, I was 18 years old when I went on my first deployment. I remember my birthday happened when I was over there. And so they asked for the oldest person and the youngest person to come up and cut the cake. So the oldest person's like 50s maybe or something. And they're looking for the youngest person. Um, and I'm like sitting in the back trying to hide or whatever. And they're counting down like upper 20s, mid 20s or something. And then like the two people that are with me are like, get up there, get up there. I'm like, I'm 18. Turning 19, I'm like, jeez. Um, and so I grew up really fast that way, I think, uh, seeing all this stuff. And it, it was great. Just, um, it's a lot of, it's something a lot of people don't really experience at all, is like being in another country in that respects, anyways, and going out and doing this. Uh, it's, it's, it's not something you can, like, I came back and people would ask how it was, and I'm like, I really can't explain it. You just had to be there and see what it was like. It's really difficult to explain. Um, but and as far as that, it's like I saw a whole new world, basically, something you never thought was out there. Um, well, I put my school on hold for a couple of years, which is no big deal. Um, I think it's made me a lot more mature. Well, I was mature to begin with, I think. Um, but it's hard because, I mean, I come to school and I'm a couple of years older and I would say a lot more mature than a lot of people who go here. And I think in that respect it's tough because other people can't relate to you. You can't relate to them. Um, so it's changed my life in that respect. I mean, just just growing up and seeing these other things. I mean, it's stuff you'll never forget. Um, but it's, I mean, it might have sucked while you were over there. I mean, th there were bad times. There was good times. And you remember, I think the weird thing is, though, you come home and you kind of push the bad times away. You only remember the good things, which is really weird. I mean, you, when you think about them, you remember the bad things. But... Um, just being able to do it was incredible, I think. Um, and I know one of the things when you interview uh, like other veterans is they say they, they always think they didn't do anything like important or worthwhile. And I know you may not agree, but I really think that I'm one of those. Like all I did was go overseas and deploy um, and secure like people and planes and stuff. Uh, I didn't really do anything extraordinary or outstanding, but I mean, Every little part is important, I'd say. And yeah, being able to know, do I, that. I, I do, do not agree with you <laughs> because I do think that. But, I mean, yeah, just, just giving your small contribution and knowing that you did that is what counts. Are there any other stories or incidents or things that you can remember this, from either of your deployments? Um, the top of my head. Um, you, you were going to remember yeah. it half hour from now. 
<laughs> I know. Um, I know, yeah, from the second deployment, just the thing I always remember is those Elvis sightings. Um, there was a lot of weird stuff that happened there, though, because everything was uh, secret. I mean, the people who were in this country's base, like, it was, it was their Air Force. Um, they had no idea why we were really there. Um, Did you and so, at all with those people? You saw them. You'd, like, drive. You'd wave. You didn't really talk to them because none of them speak English at all. Uh, some of them did, um, so you could kind of um, understand them. I know we worked with their army troops to secure the base we were at, though, which was interesting because um, we had thermal imagers like on the perimeter to look out, um, and you can see people coming from really far away, which is really good. But uh, we put one of the thermal imagers on one of their posts with their army people, and this is like it was just concrete shack almost. It was pretty big, but this is where they were living too while they were there because they were deployed from their home base in their country or whatever. Um, but we, I worked with them several nights um, and they were really cool because you'd go up to them um, and they'd make food uh, every night. That was their dinner. Um, and the good thing about it was, was their food was actually better than what they were serving in the dining hall. Uh, what they'd do is they'd make a fire every night uh, they take fe uh, fresh pita bread, which is really good, because uh, over here, I mean, you can get pita bread, but it's never fresh or anything. So over there, and then they they toast it for a couple seconds on the fire, and they'd basically have uh, different kinds of dips every night. Um, they'd have like egg stuff and tomato stuff. Um, they'd have oil and spices, um, all kinds of different stuff, and you'd uh, take a little, uh, rip a little piece of bread off, and you'd kind of like scoop up a little bit of the dip and. That was a dinner every night. Um, it was really so good. Their meals with yep, you? definitely. You should shared stuff with them. Um, I know once the our BX opened there, you could get uh, like different kinds of food, and uh, you always had the care packages being sent over. So you'd bring them like American food, and they'd love you for that. You bring them like magazines, because uh, one of them uh, had gone through a university. He could speak English really well. The others, a couple of them spro uh, spoke broken English. They could get a couple words out, and the rest was just. Uh, Arabic, so you couldn't understand them or talk to them. Um, but it was good because, I mean, they'd love you for bringing stuff up there, all kinds of cool stuff. You'd trade, like, patches or whatever you had. Um, the other thing which was really good is they made tea every night, which uh, they told me it was black tea, but I've never been able to find tea like it uh, in the States. Um, but they'd boil a pot of water, uh, take a handful of this tea, throw it in, and just dump sugar into it. It was, like, it was sweet tea. They called it chai, but it was like the best tea ever. So you'd get like a little shot glass of this stuff, and like, you'd be awake for the rest of the night. It was great, uh, but it was really good. And I've never been able to find it over here. I don't know what it is. Um, so that was, it was good to work with them. Uh, you learned a lot about what they do and stuff. Um, but yeah, you, you, it's. They kind of figured it out after a while, like why we were really there. Like, but at first, they had no idea. You couldn't tell them. So for, I mean, the first week anyway, we still weren't carrying regular weapons. We had uh, concealed M9s, which are pistols, which we've never done before, because normally you never carry it concealed in, in the military anyways, unless you're um, doing some kind of special duty or something. But I mean, every think they figured it out on their own? Oh, the, the, as, as soon as uh, well, we got there and we were just setting the whole base up, um, once the planes that we had there showed up, they, they figured it out. Um, but so there was no problem working together side by side? You never, ex problems? except for the, what I uh, just told you as far as working with them on that post, you never worked with any other ones. Not that I'm aware of, no. Well, Sean, I'd like to thank you for your time and thank you for your service to our country. Thank you.